Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'd like to start out just by making a little mention of some flyers or little tracks you may see over in the other building. Uh, you have one this morning, I hope you have, that'll help lay out what we're going to share. But these are part of a jail ministry I'm involved. And a lot of times when I'm talking with somebody, I'm kneeling down looking through a hole talking to them. And so it's hard to go very far on something, especially if somebody you're talking with doesn't understand the scriptures at all. So what I started doing is just taking little subjects that I felt were important and make them into a little track. Mm -hmm. And this way I could give it to them and then say, when I come back next Tuesday, let's talk about it. So I just want to make a quick mention. There's one on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no charge for them over there. If you are like a lot of people, sometimes you're talking with somebody uh, maybe you don't feel the situation's right, or you don't have the chance to really have the Bible right there so you can look at verses. The reason why I'm saying this, I found real often that when I'd be sharing with inmates, the next thing it was is they were seeing it's me versus them, and I didn't want that. I wanted them to realize we want to focus on the Word. If you disagree with me, then you're primarily disagreeing with the Word of God, and it's not our conflict. Uh, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit, our reasonable service. You ever get talking with somebody about the great white throne judgment? These are some verses that just shed some light on it. The mystery of lawlessness. Truths concerning good works, uh, whether by works of the law or by uh, good works themselves, we know the answer is by grace through faith. I'll make a little comment I'm sharing with this one pastor. He says, I've asked hundreds of men and nobody could answer me. Is it 100% grace? 100% faith or 100% works. I said, well, if nobody can answer you, there's something wrong with these people you're talking to. That's a fundamental of the faith, isn't it? It can't be works or, uh, I mean, basically, scriptures makes it very clear. 100% from God's side, it's grace. Amen. From our side, it's 100% we're responsible to receive it. Amen. But we know one thing, grace and faith are opposing principles of works. So if somebody even thinks works is part of the equations of being saved, then they don't understand the plan of salvation, do they? Right. Basic facts of salvation. Paul the apostle to the nations, or the Gentiles. Uh, the maturing gifts of the Holy Spirit, Romans 12, 3 through 8. And the judgment seat of Christ. So those are just some, if you're interested in those thoughts and want to take a look at it, look at it yourself, pray about it, then maybe share it with somebody else, right? Amen. And leave it with them, it gives them something to think about. I'm going to ask us to open with a prayer again because the portion I have this morning I think is really kind of unique. It's almost like it changes the subject, but yet it's really magnifying everything that's been said. But we have to understand this one verse in particular that I think oftentimes causes a little confusion. So let's share a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for this opportunity to be here, that you created the very time element that we could be here. You put the desire in our hearts to be here. Amen. You've given us your word that we could share while we're here. Uh, we, we know you've given us the Holy Spirit that he might teach us these things. And he's the true teacher of the word of God. So we pray that he'd have his way here to give me what I'm in need of and give all of us what we're in need of. That we might learn more about your word and how to understand this portion we have and how to apply it to our lives. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory in your son's most beautiful and matchless name, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn to Second to Timothy, if you would, and chapter 2. Starting with verse 20, which I think should catch our thought right away. It says, but... And we know when you see but in the scriptures, it usually means there's something being contrasted. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. I brought a couple of vessels just for us to think about. That certainly wouldn't be a very valuable vessel, would it? So that, but a clay pot, just something that would normally be used for putting inexpensive things in or trash or garbage, nothing really that important. And this is a Wisconsin tea maker. 
<laughs> won by some guy selling cheese. I'm serious. Sure that's why I had to get it from a guy. There's a guy I deal with at the bait shop up there. When I saw that, I said, I've got to get that for the conference. <laughs> but we know when we look at these two vessels, one is more valuable, isn't it? And it has a particular purpose. Oh, you certainly would bring something like this out for a special occasion where you wouldn't bring this out, would you? So this is used for a much more honorable event or occasion. This would be less. But now let's look at the next verse, which is very interesting, is then it says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet or fit for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Now I want us to think about something. We have a problem. Unless we understand there's a major contrast going on here. Can these vessels do anything about what they were made, how they were made? Mm -mm. And do these vessels really have any ability to change how they're used? Mm -hmm. But I believe the first verse is bringing almost like a little par parable or a metaphor to get our attention on something that's a really important contrast. Because the next, that verse 21 says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified or set apart, and fit for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. These vessels were made for something in particular. And one thing we know is interesting when it comes to the body of Christ, and we know that's the only thing that's possible in the next verse. He's saying we as vessels have the responsibility to prepare how we're used and what we're going to be used for. So I want us to think about this. If we, if we look at these vessels, since they can't do anything about what they're made for, can we do anything about what we're made for? Well, and that's what I believe is why it says, but right away in that verse 20, it's a major contrast. Unlike a house that would have vessels in it that are used for a certain thing, they can't change how they're used. We can. You know, one thing I found when I deal with, with inmates a lot, when they have different problems, all these programs that try to help them, the first thing they got to say is you got to understand that there's a need that you have a responsibility. If you can't get a person to, to acknowledge there's a responsibility, then they certainly can't do anything about it, can they? I would like to ask you, if you would, to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Not only do we have the ability to do something about how we're used by the Lord, we have the responsibility and the power to do it, don't we? When we look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not, and not your own? That word there for temple is nahos, means the holiest of holies where God dwells. So inside of these vessels, we have God the Holy Spirit, don't we? And then he says, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's, or they belong to God. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, if you would, just slip over a little ways, as a lot of you know, I love to look at scriptures and try not to make it too much of a Bible drill, yet at the same time, 2 Corinthians 4, I'm going to start with verse 5. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. i got to make a little comment. I was at a church one time where they didn't have any Bibles in it, which I had never seen before. And this person literally bragged that way they don't have all that noise and interruption. I said, I love to hear the sound of Bible pages turning. <laughs> For God who commands the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I believe what that's talking about, just as he commanded the light to, to come out of the darkness because of his presence. I don't believe he's talking about the light of the stars, but literally his presence 
brought forth light in the beginning of creation. But then in verse 7 it says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Can we do something about how we're used? Yes, we can, can't we? We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, and we have the presence of God there to strengthen us as we grow in his word. Now, if you would, let's go to Romans 12. As we know that the messages, many of them, in fact, our, our brother Andy was sharing the fact that how the false teachings, how powerful and deceptive it is. Are we in a day where that's become even worse? Yes. I marvel. It started when that one book came out about the Da Vinci Code. Uh, all kinds of inmates would have that reading it, and I couldn't believe it. And they'd say, we know what you're up to. And then in the book it implies that all of us that love the word were deceivers and that the church itself is trying to deceive and the Bible, Jesus wasn't really sinless. And we say, what? Uh, I'm amazed how many believers I've met in recent years that will say, do you think that Jesus was really sinless? And I'd say, well, how would you have a Savior if he wasn't? Right. I mean, our Lord and Savior, it says, God made him who knew no sin to be right. sin for us, right. that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But you know one thing I believe, when I share with inmates a lot of times, they'll say, well, that's your opinion. I could go to 10 different churches, they'll have 10 different opinions. Well, I like to say this to them. I look at them and say, you know what? You're probably right. You could go to 10 different churches and get 10 different opinions, but God's not going to judge you for those people's opinions. He's going to say, did you take time to get in my word? Amen. We know if you really read a verse, if you ask 50 people what that verse means, they'd probably all agree if they just looked at that verse and shared, because God's word is logical, isn't it? Amen. It's sensible. He gave us these brains to think with, and he's also given us his word that we can understand it. Amen. But let's look at Romans 12, verse 1. Because we know that when it comes to serving the Lord, and that's the emphasis in this idea of becoming a vessel unto honor. I think a lot of times people use that terminology, and I know they mean it well because there's a truth to it, but get out of the way and let God. Well, that might be true on certain issues, but how much of the scripture says I can do all things through Christ? With God, nothing is impossible. Uh, the very name of the Holy Spirit, paracleto, means one who comes alongside of. Do we have a responsibility? Yes. We'd all say amen, we do. And so what we want to look at this morning is how does God do that? He doesn't do it by putting us in a headlock and saying you will do it, I tell you, but he pleads with us, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, we know that becoming a vessel unto honor, nobody serves God to get saved. You have to be saved to serve God, right? Amen. And so when we look at this, he makes it clear it's brethren, not a means to become a brethren, but also that it's only by his mercies that we can serve him. We fail, don't we? How often do we fail? It says a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. So what we know is that as we have this opportunity to serve God, it's only by his wonderful compassion and provisions that we can. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. I believe what he's saying is your opportunity, isn't it? It's our chance now to say, I'm going to give up doing things my way and doing things God's way. I think I saw... Uh, uh, license plate or something once that said, God is my co-pilot. Well, if he's your co-pilot, you got problems. <laughs> he's got to be the pilot, doesn't he? Amen. And we know the answer is it's learning. In order for God to use us, I believe what he's saying is, first of all, you got to look at yourself. The work's got to begin with us, doesn't it? And he says that it's an opportunity to show the sincerity of our love as we're willing to give up those things we would like to do but rather say what brings the most glory and honor to you he says that's the holy service set apart on the here remember <clears throat> our theme is becoming vessels of honor isn't it acceptable or well-pleasing unto God which is your reasonable service I like to say a lot of times is God reasonable our God says, first of all, just admit you're a sinner. Truly accept my son in your heart as your, pers as your personal savior. And then I give you the gift of eternal life. Now serve me because you love me. 
That's pretty reasonable, isn't it? When people act like our God's unreasonable, he's not unreasonable at all. He's saying, I, I love you. I already gave you the gift of eternal life. Now show the sincerity of your love. Be not conformed to this world. Is that hard? It's so easy to communicate and be a part of something we can see and handle and touch. And it's easy to be swept up into the system or the things of the world. But what he's telling us, in fact, one of the comments was made in one of the messages, how easy it is to become fashioned like this world and start picking up. A lot of times people say, I'm really different. But no, you're just doing the same thing that many other people are doing. But the word of God is telling us, be careful. Don't be fashioned. Or, or in fact, this is where they get the word schematics. Don't be aligned with the way this world does things because God's way is different. As it says, His ways are not our ways, neither are His thoughts our thoughts. But as the heavens are far above the earth, His ways are above our ways and His thoughts above our thoughts. Now here's what we know is this is where the rubber meets the road. A lot of times people say as grace believers we don't put in practical application. Well, we know the doctrine and practical application will work together, don't they? When we look at this right here, what's the answer? How can I, now that I've admitted that I really have the responsibility to strive to be prepared for the Lord, where do I begin? We know the answer is by getting into the Word of God, right? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. And I find that interesting when it says prove. Who do we prove it to? I believe ourselves. That we'll know by testing that everything God says, if we will do what he says, it'll be good, acceptable, and perfect every time. We know there's nobody could say that I obeyed the word of God and it all fell apart and it didn't come out the way, maybe the way I thought it should. But God's ways are always the perfect way, isn't it? So very simply, what we're looking at on this first thought of becoming a vessel unto honor, we do have the responsibility and we have the ability because we have the Holy Spirit and we have the Word of God. Let's go back if we would to 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 2. I heard of a series of studies that were done over many years by some big Christian organization and that's why we're in a day that's very unique. They said about a generation, a, a couple generations before, that about 83% of people that claimed that they were saved, true born again believers, believed it was important to study the Word of God, and that it's the absolute truth, and you needed to apply it to your life. The next generation down from that, they said only about 40% of those people that claimed to be born again believers believed the Bible was the absolute truth and that it should be applied to your life. What's really scary in the generation they claim that's now is there's this uh, respond that about 7 to 8% of those that claim to be saved really believe the Bible's the absolute truth and that it should be applied to your life. We know one thing, if you don't believe the Bible's the absolute truth then that you're not just studying it to learn something but rather to apply it to your life you'll certainly never become a vessel of honor, would we? Right. It's when we see that this is the absolute truth, it's not up for opinions, not up for debate, it's God's word. When we rightly divide it, that's the truth we need to learn, but not just to learn it, to begin to apply it to our own lives. So let's look at the next verse, if you would, please. It says, flee also youthful lust. I look at that in a way I find it interesting because you know, we know when somebody's younger they're trying to take over the world. When you get older you're just happy to stay up with the world, right? <laughs> but when we look at a youthful desire it has to do with certain um, immoral desires and certainly prideful ambitions. And what we're really seeing in this next verse is there's two sides to our uh, process, isn't it, of cleansing ourselves, is putting off the things, but God doesn't just have us put off something, he has us put on something, doesn't he? So it says in that verse 22, flee also youthful lust. I don't know why, almost every time I read that verse I think of Joseph. <laughs> Remember when Potiphar's wife was trying to get him to do something wrong and he just fled from her? Well, we know just like a f fugitive on the run. You don't have to look at something and say, oh, that looks bad, and that kind of smells bad. No, you know, get away from it, right? Flee from it. But follow. And it's interesting, that word there for follow means to pursue intensely. Righteousness. Well, that word is pretty simple. It means doing what's upright, just, 
Faith, I believe, has to do with the idea of faithfulness. As it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Moreover, it's required of a steward that a man be found faithful. Charity, Galatians 5, 6, talks about faith. Uh, for in Christ neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but faith that works through love. When we see peace, I find it inter interesting. They say <clears throat> when studies are done uh, of interviewing people, they say about 80-some percent of people when asked, what would you want in your life more than anything, they want peace. We're designed to want tranquility. Uh, but we know oftentimes it's not so in the world we're in. But the scriptures tells us we're to strive to be at peace with all men, aren't we? Amen. And then it says, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Uh, I'm amazed. I mean, just the last few days, I had talked to a couple of different Christians that are, say, I'm going to say they profess to be. But right away I said, well, I don't have to go to church. And, you know, I had a guy I logged with for quite a few years, and he'd say that, and I'd say, that's right, I agree with you. I've told you that many times, but saved people will go to church. You can get saved any place. You could get saved in the middle of the woods. You could get saved in the middle of a parking lot. You could get saved sitting all by yourself. But saved people will want a fellowship with other saints. We know when you look at Paul's epistles, they're all either written to church or to church leaders, which means God says fellowship is very vital, isn't it? If we want to grow, we got to grow with those that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So let's go to the next verse. No, in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you to do something, if you would. Turn to Titus, Titus chapter 2, because the thought here is so important. Is I had heard of a, another... I, a lot of times when we're sitting there grading Bible studies, I'll be listening to a, a Christian station or something. And I was listening to it, and you, this would catch your ears right away if you heard it too. All of a sudden, the comment was made, the church has finally evolved. And it was a Christian station, one of the bigger Christian stations that there are. I hurried up and sat my thing down and turned the knob up a little bit. And what do you mean the church has evolved? And then they said, well, they've... We're finally gotten away from those old hymns played with the piano and the organ, and now we're going to the new contemporary music played with electric guitars and drums and light show. Well, I disagree. I love the old hymns. Amen. But if somebody wants to do that other part, I'll tolerate it, but don't tell me that evolved. If it did, it went way downward because the older hymns were, <laughs> were awful good. But then also the other thing that they said that we've evolved from is the old beliefs and doctrines, which would be like the old fundamentals and doctrines. And now we've evolved to experiences and emotions. Doesn't that sound like just what Paul warned? We know this, if you've evolved to there, you're in serious trouble because you're going to be tossed to and fro by every experience and emotion you have. If we're not building on the Word of God, then we're in trouble, aren't we? Verse 11 of Titus chapter 2, if you'd be so kind, it says, For by the grace of God, or the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. I heard not that long ago where there was this discussion about the greater mercies of God. And they were implying that after a person dies, no matter who they were, as long as they believed in God, they'll have another chance to make the right decision. That might sound greater to them, but it's not God's word. God's done the greatest thing he could already. The grace yeah, of God's right. appeared to all men, hasn't it? Amen. Uh, we believe that scriptures makes it very simple and clear. 1 Timothy 2.4, God desires that all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And we know the next couple of verses say that there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for, for all to be testified in due time. So if God desires all men to be saved, the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all, and we as, for example, as representatives, as his ambassadors, and I was looking at some young man's shirt this morning at the restaurant, he had the, the verse of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, where it talks about us being his ambassadors. Who are we to plead with? All men. All I just want to say is this, the Bible makes it clear, God wants all men to be saved, doesn't he? Amen. And his word makes it very simple. We've had several of the men that have made it as simple as we know that the Bible makes it. Admit you're a sinner, 
And I love to use Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouth, I believe what that's talking about is if we admit it's true about ourselves, that we're sinners, we deserve the wrath of God, but if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When we confess we're a sinner, but he died for us, and we believe that with our heart, not just in our mind, because I know I was raised in a religion, and when I went in the Marine Corps, I believed I was saved, because I, I believed in the virgin birth. I believe the Lord did all the miracles the Bible said he did. I believed he died and buried and rose again. I believed he was coming back, but I thought I was saved just because I believed in the facts. It was all up here, but it had never come to know him as my personal savior. We know it's got to be of the heart, doesn't it? But we do know without any doubt everyone in this room would say amen to if God says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved. Amen? amen. The next verse says, teaching us. In other words, after we're saved, God doesn't say, I saved you, so why don't you just continue in sin? He says he, it, that same grace teaches us that denying ungodliness, that word deny, I've heard some say, just means to say no to ungodliness. In other words, if we leave God out, whatever it is that we're doing, it's wrong, isn't it? Or worldly lust, oftentimes just looking at the things that of this world, in fact, can believers fall into those kind of things? I know Paul says in the book of Titus how Demas had left the things of God for his love for the present world. But then he tells us very simply, we should live soberly. I believe what we have is he says, first look inward, then look outward, and make sure you're looking upward. For example, soberly. Romans 12, 3 says, let no man think more highly than he ought to think. It's easy for us after we're saved to think, yet my opinion matters. I'm really important in this. And God says, no, your opinion doesn't matter. It's what's my word say, right? Don't be intoxicated with pride. Righteously, we should deal with others with justice and uprightness. Godly. Uh, in this world that we're in right now, how important is godliness? We know not only does it bless us in everything that we do while we're here, but it blesses us in the world to come, won't it? <laughs> Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many believers, now I, I, every chance I get just about I witness to somebody. But I'm amazed in about the last five years how many people I, I meet that claim to be Christians and they're involved in a church and they spend quite a bit of time in the Word of God and they believe that we're, the tribulation is either past or we're in it. And we know how many of them believe that we're looking for the second coming. But that's not what this verse here says. We're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. We're looking for that beautiful heavenly departure, aren't we? Amen. As we continue to do that, that's a reminder to us that someday we're all going to stand before him and give an account, aren't we? So how much more important it is that we make sure that we are striving to live for him. And it says, he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Whenever I think about it, he gave himself for us, I always think of Galatians 2.20. For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me in the life that I now live. I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? Amen. Amen. But why did he save us? That he would redeem us or set us free from all iniquity. And purify unto himself, and there we got that verse we were talking about earlier, to cleanse ourselves, isn't it? From all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. I think somebody made the comment earlier about a peculiar people, and sometimes we probably are a little more peculiar than we ought to be. But that word has to do with the idea of special. Right. We're special, and I'm glad I thought of that right now because I missed the other thing I wanted to say at the very beginning. You know, it's interesting in an earthly house, there's vessels that are, some are special. They're gold and silver and they're really valuable. But then there are other vessels that are just clay, pot, earth, and wood type things. You know, it's interesting about the house of God. Everyone's valuable. Amen. Everyone's been bought by the blood of Christ. Amen. And so I believe one of the contrasts that the word of God, and that's back on our verses we were talking about is so simply is that we need to realize that God's people are very special. We're the objects of his love. And we're valuable. 
And what that brings us to is that thought is, so often we view evangelism as the ultimate of everything we do, but you know, God's very much concerned with the saints that they also mature. And that's one of the themes we're seeing there in 2 Timothy, the fact that the church itself would begin to have struggles. Many would fall into apostasy and immorality. What's it going to take is other believers that love the Lord enough to help them. And so when we look at this, it says, zealous of good works, these things speak and exhort, rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. Sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, this was something, you know, everyone in this room that's read and studied the Word of God knows that you look at verses and sometimes you see something, next time you come through and you go, ooh, never saw that before. <laughs> One I've noticed a lot of times with the inmates when they'll do the book of Proverbs, they remind me a lot of me when I first started. When I first got saved, I thought, hey, that'll work out good. There's 31 Proverbs, I can do one each day. A lot of times I'd read them and think, I have no idea what any of it said. <laughs> Next time I come around, I'd get a couple things out of there, and I'd think, oh, that's really nice. I had an inmate say that recently to me. He got done, he says, I don't know if I got anything out of there. I'm so confused. I said, well, it's a really deep book, but I'll guarantee you, the next time you go through, you'll be enriched that much more than the next time, and every time we know the Word of God just keeps growing, doesn't it? Amen. Well, that reason I want to say that, look at chapter 2 in our next verse. It says, but foolish and unlearned questions, verse 23, avoid knowing they do gender strifes. Now, all of a sudden, if we're going to take the next verse with it, as it says, the servant of the Lord must not strive. Now, do you see? What, remember, the issue was becoming a vessel of honor and being used by the Lord. First, we have to admit that we have the responsibility and then to begin to apply that to our lives, right? He says, the foolish and unlearned questions avoid. That word foolish there is where we get our word moron. And we know you don't want to get in a debate with a moron because you're not going anywhere. Or foolish, or I mean unlearned, ignorant questions avoid because they do gender strife. Is it easy to get into a debate with somebody and just uh, have it be a mess? Uh, in fact, like I said, with what I deal with all kinds of different people and having so many that I'm talking with while in the jail, a lot of times they want to get you off on stuff that just makes no sense. It's just their opinion or it's something that has to do with traditions of men or whatever it is. But one part that hit me years ago was Proverbs 26.4. says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. So it's interesting, it's saying, don't answer a person that's just talking nonsense. I mean, as silly as, could God make a rock so big he can't even pick it up? What sense would there be to, to discuss something like that? And we know that's the kind of nonsense people can get you into. The next verse in the Proverbs says, answer a fool according to a fo his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And one of the first times that I saw those two, I started, I, I mean, got a little upset with God. I thought, well, what am I supposed to do? You said, don't answer the fool according to his folly. Then you say, do answer the fool according to his folly. What am I supposed to do? The answer is having wisdom. Basically, when a person's unsaved, they are going to ask what we would consider foolish and ignorant questions. But you can quickly tell, are they looking for truth? Or are they, in fact, Brother Ricky has told me how he sometimes gets people out right in, and he can kind of tell quite quickly, is this person really looking for truth or are they just looking for an argument? And we know that's what we got to learn. If you're dealing with somebody that they're really just out to exalt their own opinion, don't waste your time because all you do is look like them. And if you're like me, I'm not always the best tempered. The Lord's working with me a lot. But I'm talking about I used to find myself yelling back and forth with somebody and I'd think later, well, you looked as silly as they did. Yeah. And you can't do that, right? So the, it says that basically it's telling us if you want to be a vessel unto honor, Think about how this has worked out. First of all, you've got to know there's a responsibility. Now you're looking at yourself because God says, I'm beginning with you. And now he's opened up the door. You're becoming a servant, a vessel on the honor. The next verse says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. We, we shouldn't be quarrelsome. And I think it's easy to get like that is the more you know the word of truth and you've heard and you see how some people respond. It's easy to become combatant. 
and aggressive. And where in the world, doesn't it seem like oftentimes people are aggressive and abrasive? And he's saying, the servant of the Lord can't be like that. But be gentle unto all men, apt or able to teach, patient. And I believe when it's talking about patient there, that word means enduring. It's going to be tough. Uh, when we are like we've been all sharing, when you share the gospel, the word of God says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's going to be opposition, isn't there? <coughs> I remember I had the uh, old Proverbs because I was thinking, I know there's a proverb that fits in there I had the, that I had thought of. Proverbs 18.19 says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city and his contentions are like the bars of a castle. <laughs> if we're abrasive with those we're trying to share with, oftentimes they'll just withdraw and they won't deal with it and you can't get any place with them. And I'm going to give myself as an example and you're going to say, you were something wrong with you back then. I hadn't been saved very long, I'm going to say a year or two, and I tracked my parents' house with anti-denominational things of their religion. And I mean, I put them everywhere, because I wanted them saved, and so, but these were really, I look at it uh, as years went on, the material was far too aggressive. But I stuck it around all, all the places I could find. When your own mother tells you, you come back in this house and do that again, we won't let you in the house again. Then you'd kind of cross some line. <laughs> but I, I realized after that, it took quite a while to share with my mom or dad because they were so offended by the things that I did. I'm just saying, if we really want to be able to, to reach people, we got to be careful not to be real argumentative and aggressive, right? Uh, because once you offend somebody, like it says, their contentions are like the bars of a castle. It's awful hard to get back in and share with them. Then verse 25, it says, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Now I think in some ways, this, the way this is written, it sounds a little confusing, but I really believe we can, uh, as we look at it, it says, If God, pre-adventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. I want us to think about this. And this goes back to our theme. Was that great house in verse 20? Some say, well, that's the, the professing church. So the vessels of honor and the vessels of dishonor would be the saved and the unsaved. And that becomes quite a big issue, and especially when you get down here. Are we talking about unsaved people or saved people? One, I do know some people that use these verses. I'm going to read 26 with the two. Uh, let me read it all together as one. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging or the full understanding of the truth, that they may recover themselves. And this idea, this me is talking about coming to their senses. Can an unsafe person come to their senses? No. Uh, and literally, out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Uh, what I want us to think about, is this talking about believers or unbelievers? I believe it's clearly talking about believers. Amen. And I'm going to say something which is interesting, which is a major part of the theme of First and Second Timothy. First, there's going to be this terrible departure. Second Timothy 4.1 says, The Spirit expressly says, In the latter time some shall fall from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. So there will be this terrible departure from the faith. Can't be unbelievers, it'd be believers. And then in Second Timothy chapter 3, it talks about the last days when perilous times come people become lovers of themselves. I believe it's saying there's this impact of what has happened even to the church, the body of Christ. So what I want us to think about is this. Does it, uh, we would all say what a shame if a believer fell into the trap of false teaching. And I believe it happens a lot more than we can imagine. I meet a lot of people that I think really are saved and they've allowed themselves to false Sure. for some nonsense teaching uh, that's drawing them away from sound truth. Uh, and then also if we think about how many believers nowadays believe, I mean when we, we're talking about that seven, eight percent, 
That's what I find I meet when I talk to a lot of people. They say, God doesn't really care. It's under the blood. I can live just about any way I want. Well, we know Romans 6, 1 answers it real simple. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? But who is it that's going to help that believer that's fallen into that? It's going to be another saint that loves the Word of God enough that they're going to share the sound truth of God's Word. But also, how about the believer that even falls into the trap of thinking, uh, it doesn't really matter if I'm mature or not. Uh, I had put that down Second or 1 Corinthians 3.1. Paul said to the Corinthians, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Have you met believers that think God doesn't care anymore? I mean, I hear a lot, especially once that the government said, no, it's okay to live any way you want. In fact, just teach them how to, to uh, experience safe sex. How do you safely disobey the Word of God? Uh, or how to, to do, I mean, we're, we're being told things that are being acceptable today that if you think any different, there's something wrong with you. We know one thing, uh, as it is written, let God be found true in every man a liar that when you're judged, you'll be justified by him. He's the one that matters, doesn't he? What I'm just saying, is it, is it something that we should be concerned with, that there are saints that fall into false right. teachings, there are saints that fall into bad conduct, but also there are some that fall into the trap to think, oh, God doesn't really care what I do. Uh, but we know this, that one of the messages had to do with oh, Brother Kevin. Take one letter out of the typewriter and how many words didn't make sense anymore. I know as a pastor, and I know probably every pastor in here would say it, and every saint that's busy serving the Lord, how many, how often is there a saint that's not doing much of anything? But they think, well, God doesn't, doesn't really care. It doesn't matter. Well, it does, doesn't it? Amen. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, if you would, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, that's not on, is it? I don't think, I was looking at it, I thought it looks like it's saying the same thing. That's <laughs> why so I didn't know. A couple times I thought, am I losing my mind or whatever? Tell I look, it says the same thing. Time has stopped. Second Corinthians 10 verses 1 and 2 is another example of that whole idea we were taught about as servants for the Lord. Paul could have been very harsh with the Corinthians in some places he does, but in this particular case he uses that strategy of just pleading with them, doesn't he? Second Corinthians 10 verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but be an absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. I believe the apostle is a pleading with pleading with all these rebellious believers at that time that were fighting against the message of grace and he's trying to, he's going to tell them what you need to be is fighting the good fight of the faith, not fighting against the faith. We know that, I, I mean, I'm amazed how many times you can be sharing with somebody and you're doing fine until you mention Paul's epistles in a particular way that you're saying he's a distinctive <laughs> apostle with a distinctive message and how quickly they get upset with you. Uh, I'm going to just read it real quick and I can share a little thought. But in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read it real quick myself. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. I guess those who want to turn there, if you want to. Uh, I had a friend of mine call me up one time. You'd have to realize how many times this guy would debate the grace message. So he calls me up one day and he says, Pastor, you got to understand, I got myself a red-letter Bible. I'm thinking, well, you know, who doesn't have a red-letter Bible? <laughs> oh, no, he says, this is a real red-letter Bible. He says, all of Paul's epistles are in red. <laughs> so he starts laughing. I said, well, that would be better than most. We know the truth is, all the Bible is the Word of God, isn't it? Amen. And Paul's epistles are, I'm amazed how many people think Paul was like a, a religious entrepreneur, that he just come up with some nice ideas. The truth is, he says, very simply, 
I certify that the gospel preached as me is not after men, for I neither received it nor was I taught it, but by the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same Lord Jesus Christ who was crucified and died and buried, rose again, gave Paul this message that we're, we call the gospel of the grace of God that we are to follow. Amen? Amen. But in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, it says, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Uh, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? In other words, if you don't acknowledge how important the message is that was given to and through the Apostle Paul, then you're going to be ignorant of what God's doing today. Now, I hope you didn't leave 2 Corinthians, because I wasn't done there yet. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Looks like it's close. So. One of the biggest things I saw in this portion that I, I believe it fits perfect with all the messages that I've heard because it's, of course, it's God's Word, is that he's been talking about being a, a teacher, being a good soldier, being a competitive athlete, uh, being a hardworking farmer, uh, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. And you know, that should stir up a person's heart and they'd say, okay, okay, I'm ready. What do I do? Instead of jumping out of the gate and your horse is going every which way, God's saying, well, number one, you, you, now you recognize you have a responsibility. You know, instead of going and trying to change everybody else, what he's saying is let's get to work on the inside for you to become that vessel of honor. And really what we found there in 2 Timothy, the next thing you know, is God faithful to his word? You're out there serving the Lord. What better honoring vessel is that? We were to prepare ourselves to serve the Lord. And he's saying, next thing you know, it's taught about a servant serving the Lord. And what I just want to say is here, I think we're in a time right now, at least I experience it all the time, that I feel like I spend most of my time debating with other professing believers. But I believe there's a real need for that. Yes. Especially in America, because just about everybody claims to be saved. Yes. Well, the answer is we know most of them are deceived. And too often there are those that are saved and now have fallen into something and they've been taken captive. I, I will say this, I, I really believe that if you say you're a, a, a child of God, you're serving the Lord, and yet you never butt heads with Satan or his host, then you're walking in the same direction. <laughs> you know, because something's not right. He's going to make your life tough. And as we look at it right here, we know this, whether a person acknowledges it or not, every one of us are in a warfare. The moment yeah. you're saved, right. you're out on the front lines, you can either become a casualty or you can become a good soldier that fights the good fight. You can end up being a vessel of honor. But I, I don't want to lose this thought, that how important it is that we try to help other believers and, and recognize when you see somebody that's really saved and yet they're just confused or they've been taken into some deceptiveness to gently try to show them this is the sound truth of God's word. And that's what I believe Paul does here. He says in verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, <clears throat> we do not war according to the flesh. Uh, our warfare is with principalities and powers in heavenly places, isn't it? We really aren't fighting individual people. The idea is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I believe the weapons it's talking about here is the sound truth, the doctrines, the truth of God's word. Yes, we are in a time where people are saying, I don't want to hear that. In fact, you know what? When they were talking about in America how the Bible-believing churches were closing at an alarming rate, I was amazed when they said the number one reason people had said they stopped going to a Bible church, they didn't want somebody preaching at them. Because <laughs> we know the truth is when you preach the Word of God, we're all falling short of it. And in fact, I'll say this, years ago, this was when I was still hauling wood and stuff, and this guy was preaching and it had, had happened a few weeks in a row. And this, the pastor afterwards, I walked up to him, I said, listen, you got something to say to me, you say it to me, you don't get up there and say it. And then all of a sudden he, said, he says to me, he says, well, I was just preaching, and all guilt just fell all over me. I thought, no, that's not, that's the word of God, it's live, and it tells us when we have a problem. Amen. And so I just, we know this, when we hear the word of God, every one of us are going to have to admit, no matter when we hear a message, I'm falling short. 
but I believe God deals with us in this way, just like a, a parent does with their children. You can do better. So no matter how good we're doing, we don't want to ever say, well, I've achieved, I'm there, I'm perfect. The truth is we all want to say, I know I can do better. Now how can I apply this truth to my life? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly, but they're spiritual, you might say. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What do you, when you think of a stronghold, isn't that something that's been reinforced and fortified? You know, sometimes, uh, and we know we're guilty of it, when there's something you want to believe, man, you'll grab everything you can to fortify that, build a real nice platform or a nice wall. Well, the Word of God, when it's the truth, it'll pull down, won't it? Pulls down strongholds. But also, it casts down imaginations. I believe the Word of God even knows when we're starting to build this little thing that we're working with, and we're going to make that into a fortress we're imagining. Uh, in fact, uh, in Hebrews 4.12, it says, The Word of God is quick and living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, pierce, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When God's Word is spoken, God says, I already know what you're working on in the background. Let's make the adjustments to do it my way, right? But aren't we so glad that we get this blessing to serve the Lord? Amen. And somebody help, has helped us along the way. I've heard right. some say it when we were young Christians. Somebody blew our nose and changed our diapers and did whatever we needed. Now sometimes we may have to help somebody else. But right. that's all a part about growing, isn't it? Right. That rest of that verse is casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. His word's the final authority every time, isn't it? It's the absolute truth. So when we close at 2 Corinthians, if you would come back there with me for just a moment, I'm going to close in and our 2 Timothy. Yes. I was just testing you to see if you knew where you were. <laughs> 2 Timothy. Like I said, this is the first time I saw it quite the way I did this time. I always knew that it was talking about vessels of honor to the fact that it begins with recognizing we're not like an earthly building where those vessels, some are for a valuable and they're used for honor and some for dishonor. And I personally believe that's why it says, but all of a sudden that comes out of there. And I should say this in verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, you're going to have to make your decision. But I, I personally believe it's picking up from verse 19 where it says that everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. Because when you do that, that means the focus is now on me, and then I'm going to get rid of those things of dishonor in my life, and as I do, then the Lord will be able to use me for, for honorable purposes. Now some might say, well, the thing's been these people are teaching false teachings. Well, as we grow in the Word of God, we'll recognize it, won't we? That's right. I heard a person once that was world famous, I guess, for telling counterfeits. This guy, the way they claim you could take some money and pull it like this almost and hardly let him see it. And he'd be able to tell you if it was a counterfeit or not. And so they asked him, how'd you become such an expert? Do you study all these counterfeits? He said, no, I study the real thing. Amen. I had a person get mad at me one time. He says, uh, it was my own cousin. He says, he asked me a question. So I said, well, the word of God says, and he says, that's all you say. The word of God says this, the word of God says that. I says, that's the only authority I have. I don't want to give you my opinion. Uh, we know we serve a great God, don't we? Amen. But the word of God's got to begin by us hearing it. Uh, we read it. We study it. We memorize it as it's coming into our lives. And we're being cleansed. The idea is all of a sudden, the next thing you'll know, you'll be serving the Lord. I know when I first got saved, I could I I owned a, I had a party store, so I thought, what do I do now? This is really you know. And I thought, how am I going to get away from all these people and all these things that was going on in my life? But I all I I knew I had been re raised in religiousness, and I thought I don't want to be a hypocrite again. I want to know the truth. So in a sense, I can say this to all of you: I began to attack the Bible with this earnestness that I thought because I was raised that it's more or less a good book, but it's not the absolute truth. But the more I started studying the Word of God, as the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The next thing I knew, I didn't have to figure out what I was going to do with my friends. Most of them disappeared. They thought, you don't want to get around this guy. Everything he says is the Bible says, this the Bible says that. But we know the truth is that's what our hearts should speak, shouldn't it? We begin by recognizing we have the responsibility to become vessels of honor. 
God says, let it start with you. And as we work on ourselves, I believe the next thing he says, and a servant of the Lord. Now you're serving the Lord. We're being used as a vessel of honor. Let's go. Sorry. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We know you're always faithful to your word. And it is the absolute truth in every matter that's important. So we just pray. Give us a heart that we have desire to be into your word to not just study it so that we might know more than somebody else or to, to be Amen. able to argue with people, but that we would do it because we love your word and That's we right. want to Amen. first apply it to our lives. And as we do, then you'll give us opportunities that we might help somebody else that's Hallelujah. struggling. And what a blessing that is. Yes, we want to see the unsaved saved. But also, as it's been repeated a few times, that the word salvation isn't always talking about the unsaved getting saved, but there's times believers need to be helped to be delivered from whatever it is that's caused uh, a person to be sidetracked or trapped by a scheme of the devil. We thank you for your word. It says, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Uh, that we might be able to withstand the schemes of the devil. We'll give you the praise, we'll give you the glory, and we pray it in that most precious and eternal name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much.